Hello and welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops, a former D1 Hooper and current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Omari Sanko for the second Pistons beat writer for the Detroit Free Press. And of course, we're always blessed to be joined by our producer, Wes Davenport. And Amari, we are 120 episodes in, and right before we recorded, I was like, hey, I, I got to get up the outline. I don't think I can read my intro if I don't have the... It just, it was funny that it's become such a crutch to have that. So again, peek behind the curtain, like we just have an episode template and it has my intro, your intro, segment one, segment two, segment three, the outro that you read at the end, and Wes just copy and paste that and then put stuff in. And because today is essentially a, a big board episode... I hadn't even looked at the outline because essentially we're just going to top the top 10 guys on our board or whatever. And I was like, oh, no, I need that. I will definitely mess up the phrasing of that. You would think I could read it in my sleep, Amari, but I absolutely cannot. I would have messed that up bad. No, I have to look up the closing part too all the time, even though it's the same handful of names every single week. I feel like I could do it by memory, but it would just be terrible if I forgot somebody and then it's like. I forgot somebody. Like, yeah. that's not good. So it's kind of like when you open your calculator and add two plus two sometimes. It's like, I know it, but I just, like, just got to see it. I got to trust it. Yeah, you got to make sure. We are doing a big board episode. So we're talking Alex Saar. We're talking Matas Buzelis. We're talking Zachary Riesesche. We'll talk Dalton Connect. We'll talk Nikola Topic is my guess. This is going to be a board that is not Piston specific, but we'll obviously have plenty of Pistons twists and conversation that go along with each player. We're going to talk Nikola Topic, even though he doesn't make a whole lot of sense for the Detroit Pistons. We'll get to as many guys as we can. If you guys have questions, comments, as we're talking through players, definitely throw it in there. If you have a player you want us to talk about, we'll probably get to him. But if not, maybe we'll get to him at the end. So plenty of time between now and the draft, obviously, but this is an entirely an NBA draft episode. Outside of this, Omari, I do want to ask you, We've seen all eight game ones of the NBA playoffs. We saw the Nuggets beat the Lakers. We saw the Celtics be the Celtics against the Miami Heat. We saw Dame go crazy against the Pacers. We saw the Timberwolves win by a bazillion points against the Suns. I believe I heard that every home team won game one over the weekend. What was your biggest takeaway from the NBA playoffs game ones? I mean, you know, for the most part, the... the the better teams look better, right? You know, it's probably one of the, like, I won't say boring because it's like playoff basketball. Like, there's always going to be some level of, of interest higher than the regular season game, obviously. But just the number of blowouts, you know, I thought hopefully could have some more intrigue to like games two and three because we've seen teams come out cold and then they kind of get that jolt to them. Like, oh, it's the playoffs. Like, we can't, you know, come out with that same level of effort and then things change. But really the only truly great game I thought was Oklahoma City, New yeah. Orleans last night which what it was 17, 17 at the end of the first quarter or whatever. And just both teams were defending at such a high level. And then just the, the, the shot making down the stretch, like the block from Chet, just, you know, you're seeing guys in, in their first playoff environment, like really both ways. Like I know the Pelicans have had a bit more success, but none of those guys are really battle tested either. So you have these two hungry teams and just huge moments for Shea and for, Chet Holmgren, obviously. So that game was great. And hopefully that's the tone of that series going forward because I think New Orleans is probably a bit overqualified as an eight seed, even, you know, with Zion out and him being out tough, but it could still be a really competitive series. Yeah. So let's get into this. Uh, my big things were, I think that Mavs Clippers game was surprising to me. You know, the Clippers without Kawhi just go in. Terrence Mann and Ivanch Zubat, Zubats were incredible in that game, as was James Harden. And then also the Timberwolves just kind of manhandling the Suns and what a lot of people pegged as a tough matchup for them. So, And then also the Knicks and what they do. There's something I just really like about this Knicks team. So I, I think a lot of these game twos, as you say, will, will give us a little bit better of a tone of the series. I know then game threes or you know, the teams have to finally go on the road and people will say that's quote unquote when a series really starts. But I think the response of some of these teams in game two will tell us as well. Before we get into players, we've already had a couple of questions that go somewhat hand in hand. So Matt says, what if the Pistons just refuse to make a selection? JK, he's obviously joking, but nobody in this class is worth the top five money. And then Sham says, what can Pistons, not the Sham, but what can Pistons get if they trade their number one, assuming they get number one? What's its value in a trade? Is it wise to have another young player? So let's just touch on this real quick, Amari, before we get into the players, because that is going to be important. and. 
I text or tweeted with somebody before we recorded that I think the one scenario, Amari, is a team falls in love with Alex Saar and let's say the Wizards. I think the Wizards are the most obvious team with a need at the big man position. Maybe they don't love Donovan Klingon or something like that and they just feel like they have to go get Alex Saar. Now, the tricky thing is, how do the Pistons convince them that they are going to take Alex Saar? You know what I mean? So if it's one, two... Why would the Wizards not just sit and wait for it? That's the one guy I think that a team would trade up for, in my opinion, is Alex Saar. And that's the only scenario where it happens, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, there's a, like just from talking to people, like you, there's a certain amount of certainty you have going in. Like, oh, like these picks probably have the most value. And in this draft, I would assume it's probably top three, depending on if teams are in love with Saar, or maybe Reese Shea, or, you know, maybe you have a team that, really wants to read Shepard or whoever. Like, I know draft boards are really all over the board right now. A lot of that's really just going to come down to how the lottery shakes out, too, because I think in a draft yeah. like this, you're going to have teams that just love certain guys and are going to take them regardless. But a lot of that's also going to be based on where they have a whole positionally. Like, you have teams that are set that center that probably wouldn't consider Sar at all, right? So it does come down to that mostly. But I would say... If you're looking at guys who could have the right mix of instant impact and like the long term potential, like Star probably checks both of those boxes to the highest extent, given that probably day one, he could already be a pretty useful player on both ends just because of his instincts and his motor. You know, but then you can look at his growth as a shooter, as a ball handler, this and that. And then you see how much the ceiling increases. So I know this isn't a draft for you. Like you always want the number one pick. This isn't like the number one pick or bust type draft, but just from the standpoint of, the Pistons probably have interest in not adding another 19-year-old and like moving this thing forward a bit faster. And that's going to come up to the next president of the basketball operations, or I guess they're calling it head of basketball operations. Uh, but it'll come down to whoever that is. But I could definitely see them top three pick. They just use it to sweeten the package, uh, take advantage of a team that needs to shift salary because they lost in the first round of the, of the playoffs, like maybe a Chicago Bulls or you know somebody along those lines. And there will be some opportunities there for sure. But I think we'll get a much clearer picture once we get past the lottery. All right. So you mentioned it. Let's just go ahead and, and get it out of the way. Jay says, what's good, fellas? Any updates on the front office? Dax Hoop says, how does a team like the Pistons even plan for the draft without a head of basketball operations? I'll just say, like, you still have a full scouting department. So maybe you don't know who you're going to take. And at some point, you have to have that plan in place. But they don't even know where their own pick is right now, right? It could be anywhere from one to five. And so I think at the end of the day, as long as you're scouting, which I assume they are and have done all year, you can still have that stuff ready to present to whoever that person ends up being. But to the other question, real quick, Amari, any updates? I, I know the fan base is very intrigued and excited, I guess, with this. No, I, I think we'll start to know more in the next week. They tabbed the search firm to kind of lead this process for them last week. So nothing to update right now, but hopefully next episode there will be something. And Kyle brings up an interesting point as well. Also, the new head of basketball, I, I refuse to call it a hobo. Probably bring That's why I say it should be president because just like... I'm not you, calling you, it that. Like you naturally want to say pobo. So it's only nice that you say hobo, which just sounds disrespectful. So I feel like they should I'm go not a president in that head. I am that taking, I'm taking a stand and anybody who wants to come with me, Jerry Maguire style, you can stand with me on this. I refuse to call it that. I will refer to it by name once the person is hired or head of basketball operations. I will not. But Kyle brings up a good point. They're going to bring info with them as well. You would think that whoever they hire for this position has done some of their scouting and have an idea roster building wise and all of that as well. So. Yeah, Let's it get, seems like I'll add that teams, regardless of what pick they have, like they scout the entire draft. Oh, even yes. If, so if, even if you poach somebody from a different team that's like outside the lottery or more in like the 10 through 14 range, like it doesn't matter. Like whoever they bring in is going to have done their homework and will be able to adapt to whatever the Pistons present. Even if they're like a different guy, like they will have enough of a base to know who to pick. And l listen, this came up a, a few years ago. I think it was the Kate Cunningham draft. When it's like, why are they bringing in Evan Mobley to work out? Well, what if Evan Mobley doesn't work with the Cavs? Don't you want that have sat down and interviewed him to have him in for a workout? So again, like, again, we'll talk about Nikola Topic at some point, Amari. The Pistons should absolutely try to bring in Nikola Topic to work out for them. Now, he may not do it. Like his representation might say, like, this is a waste of time. Why, why would we send him to Detroit when they're not going to draft him? But look at James Wiseman. I have no idea if James Wiseman worked out for the Pistons, but you want to get as much information on all of these guys as possible 
first, second contract situations, trade situations, all of that. So they should be doing their due diligence on every one of these prospects. Let's get into them though. Let's talk about them. Like I say, we want to try to get to 10 guys if possible. Let's start with Alex Sar. I've talked a lot about him. I put a scout out. Guys, if you want to read my raw notes scouting reports, I'm putting those on the basketball bulletin. Trevor Lane and Keith Smith have been kind enough to let me contribute over there. So you can go subscribe and read those. And as we get closer to the draft, I'll start dropping them on the Motor City Hoops sub stack as well. But Amari, your thoughts on Alex Sar, the player with no Detroit Pistons consideration at all, just Alex Sar and who he is. Yeah, he's my number one. Like, I look at a guy like that. Just, he doesn't have the best shooting touch right now, but it's touch around the rim, the way he could push the ball in transition, just the tools he has on defense, the switchability. He reminds me of Jared Jackson Jr. a lot. Like, Jared is not, like, the best shooter either, but he's good enough that you have to at least consider the threat of him shooting, and he could have nights where he heats up. And if Sar could just get to that point, like, you're just talking, like, 34%. Like, you're talking a really good two-way you know, power forward slash center, I think, for a long time. He's the guy in this draft who just checks both boxes for me as far as immediate impact and long-term upside. And I'm, this, I know this is like our personal big board and not our Pistons big board. But even for the Pistons, like you have Duran and, and Isaiah Stewart. But, you know, for a guy to come in with those defensive tools immediately, I think you have to consider that. So, yeah, I, I want to clarify this. So we're going to go down my current big board and then Amari will say like, hey, this is where I have this guy. I have Alex Star number one. And quite honestly, Amari, I did a, a recent community mock with our guy Richard Stamen at Mavs Draft. If you guys aren't following him, it's time to do that. This this is what this guy does this time of year. I took Alex Sar, and part of it's going to be because the guys we talk about after this, you know, Risa Shea has not shot the ball as well recently. Matas Buzelis has some questions. Do you take Dalton Connect number one? Do you take Reed Shepard number one? Those guys have flaws of their own, as we'll talk about when we get to them. So I just took Alex Sar, Amari because he is the number one player on my board. Like I am very, very close and I've bounced back and forth doing this, putting him in his own tier. Right now, I essentially have a tier of like 10 guys that we're going to talk about because, you know, Rob Dillingham could go 10 or he could go two, depending on, like you said earlier, where the draft lottery plays out. So uh, you said a lot. I think defensively, I'm really excited about the ground he covers. I've always been higher than everybody else on his offensive potential. This was a guy, when I started my foundational deep dives this past off season, I was like, why is this guy not being talked about more? And everybody said consistency and all of that. So real quick, the numbers, under 9.5 points, 4.7 rebounds, an assist, half a steal, one and a half blocks, 1.1 turnovers. Here's the thing you got to remember, guys. He was playing in a professional league in the NBL and not even playing 20 minutes a game. So 50% from the field, 28% from three, just under 70% from the free throw line. There is some like real offensive potential there. It's not realized at all, Amari, but this guy moves really, really well. I've often comped him to Evan Mobley. The Jaron Jackson Jr. one is interesting as well with, you know, especially with Jaron not being a great rebounder, actually needing to play next to a bigger five man. I can see that a little bit, depending on who you talk to, depends on whether, let's talk about the Pistons fit. One, do you think he can play with Jalen Duran? Two, do you think it matters? Like, do you just draft them and figure it out? What are your thoughts with Alex Sar and the Pistons specifically? After a 14 win season, I say you just could not consider position at all. And I know people would think about all the resources they've invested in the center over the last four years. And like, sure, like that's enough to make your stomach hurt given how much <laughs> they've sacrificed to not get what they need for that position anyway. But I think Sar is just the type of guy that you just take and you figure it out later. You don't, you just cannot afford that all to, Consider position at any point. Like we both agree that he's the guy that if you have number one, you just take him and figure it out. He's just to be such a good modern four, you know, and that you really need a four who can handle a variety of defensive assignments. I think you need that versus the to the in the front court. And it's like Jaron, right? Or or Moby, like those guys can play the five, but you probably want more of a four next to them. And Mobley's not really that great of a shooter at all, but it works next to Jared Allen just because of how stifling they are defensively. And obviously you have to have enough scoring around them to make it work. But I got to look at Duran and Isaiah Stewart now. I think great Isaiah Stewart shot the ball really well last season, but he doesn't really give you what Star gives you. That's just an all-around scorer. Uh, he has a bit more size, a bit more athletic. 
you know, I think there's upside with him and Durant, especially since Durant is such a dominant rebounder. You can just tell sorry, hey, just go out there and just, That's fair. you like know, it. like yeah. just go out there and, pr- and play free safety, basically, you know, like you can just really have him as a, a, a roamer, knowing that Durant's going to gobble up a lot of rebounders. So, I, like, I think it works great, personally. Like, it's not perfect, but compared to where you are, like, that's going to get you a lot further. And I do want to get to other guys, so I don't want to stay on Sar for too long, because I'm sure we'll talk about him a bunch. I... A week ago, I think it was, Wes, whenever I was sending those pictures to you, I had kind of like looked at lineup data and I found a way, like this wasn't like, you know, breaking stuff, but to get both of them 30 minutes a game and you only had to play them 12 minutes together, right? So you could essentially start the, you know, the first half with them together, the second half with them together, all of that. And so I I think... And in, in those minutes, like, just don't have a SAR on the floor, right? Don't have Jaden. Like, those are the minutes where you have to have, say, Quentin Grimes, hopefully spacing the floor better than what we saw, and Simone Fontecchio. So I, I think there's a rotation there. I think where it gets a little bit convoluted, Omari, is how many minutes does a SAR have to play at the floor? How many minutes then do you find for Isaiah Stewart and all of that? So it, it is interesting. I do think it can work. You got to find the right rotations with it right now because of how I feel about some of these other guys. Like I just am not comfortable taking anybody over him at number one. Steven Sugg says, do we really want to hitch our wagon to Duran? Honestly, he's not the be all end all of sinners. Get Sar trade Duran. I wouldn't say immediately trade Duran, but I don't mind the idea of bringing in more competition. Listen, if we haven't seen this Troy Weaver love for sinners over the last four years, I don't even think this would be as big of a conversation, right? Like it's just... Oh, Troy Weaver drafts another big guy. So that's Alex Sar. Number two on my list still, Omari, is Zachary Risache. Now, I, again, like I, I know for some people he's really dropped. For others, not as much. This kid is averaging 10.5 points on 46% from the field. He is down, quote unquote, down to 39% on three and a half attempts from three, 70% from the free throw line, three and a half rebounds, an assist, a steal turns it over one and a half, 23 minutes a game, again, in a professional league overseas. He's played 53 games this year and he just turned 19. So he played the majority of this season as an 18 year old in a professional league. I do give that some credence. I know a lot of people don't like the age thing, Amari. I think you have to consider it in some context in some of these situations. Where are you at with Zachary Risa You do. It's funny. So our list start the same at number one. I know we talked a little bit before the pod. They both end the same around 10, 11, which I know we got to hurry up and so we could actually try to get that <laughs> deep into it. Risa Shea, he was my number two, but in the past few weeks, he's fallen all the way down to number five for me. Yeah, that's, yeah. And I think the reason for that is because, like, I do give him a little bit of extra credit for how young he is. Like, that is appealing, like 6'9", solid athlete. His shooting really fell off the back half of the year, but mechanically, I still think he's going to be pretty good. Like yep. he's he's decent at the line. It, for me, if he's not hitting shots, what else is he giving you? No, and I kept thinking scary. about that, and that's what I kept coming back to. If sure. he's not hitting shots, and let's say he just ends up being around like a 38% shooter, is his ceiling higher than a guy like, like a Cam Johnson, who is pretty good defensively, and I think he's a much better defender than Risa Shea is, granted, Cam Johnson was also like 23 or 24 when he was drafted. So you're talking about like a six-year difference in development. Like, it's nothing against Risa Shea. For me, it's just more so I think there are guys who give you more immediately. And it's tough for, to talk myself into that much of a, a project, just given that he hasn't shown those other things you want to see yet. No, that's fair. And this is why, again, if he was still shooting 45% from three, I would probably have him number one on my Pistons specific board, right? And that's why in this recent mock, I took Alex Sar. The thing is, he's still shooting almost 40% from three as an 18-year-old. Where I've gotten a little frustrated is everybody's like, oh, look at the last, you know, just look at the last month. Well, look at the whole season. Isn't that why we want to see these guys play a whole season is to get as much data as possible. Now, if he finishes off the year and it's down to 35% and he drops below 70% from the free throw line, sure. To answer your question about what else he does, I do think he's a good defender. I think he will guard on that end of the floor. He has good length. YouTube user asks about athleticism. I would say average. I don't think he's going to blow you away. I've seen him miss some shots around the rim where it's like, man, I wish you would have been a little more explosive. And then I've seen some impressive ones as well. But he's not just... I, I had an NBA scout say call him the French Trey Murphy the third. I don't think he has anywhere close to the bounce that Trey Murphy yeah, I was gonna has. Say. Yeah, but that's the archetype and role of player that I think people are evaluating him as. 
And so what I will say, Amari, is he does cut off the ball well. He offensive rebounds well. He has the knack for those things. And I have in my notes, he just plays the game the right way. And I know often people don't like hearing that. It's kind of coach speak. But I just watch him and I'm like, oh, I kind of like that. I will also say I recently went and watched just all of his field goal attempts. And he was doing some off stuff off the bounce that it was at least intriguing, even if he wasn't finishing. I know there was a graphic that was put out recently by No Ceilings where he was very low on field goal percentage at the rim in the half court. You also have to consider attempts in that context. Cody Williams was at the top of that. He's only attempted 50 his entire season at Colorado. So there's some other context, competition, and all of that as well. No doubt. And I like recent swing as a, a prospect. It wasn't like I was watching them and I just like soured. It's just, I think, especially in the tournament, there were some guys I like more anyway, but especially in the, the tournament, I think some of those performances really did bump a couple guys a little bit higher for me, uh, which we'll get to a segment two. We'll go in and close out segment one. But when we get back, we're going to try to get a bit more rapid fire with these yeah. and get through the rest of our respective draft boards. All right, we're back with segment two. Bryce, unless you have any more pressing recent shade thoughts, so I'm curious to hear what your, your number three is. Yeah, so I have Matas Bezelis number three here on my board. So where before, we're so different. Okay, <laughs> All right, so go ahead, yeah. you, you have him low. Where do you have him? You, I assume you have him low. Here's the thing. Yeah. Again, real quick, I my line. So it, on my board, I have 84 players ranked. Amari, I have tier breaks. I have like strong black lines that break tiers. It goes to 10. So again, I, I, I'm not going to quibble with somebody who has Matas Bazelis 10. So like, it's all uh, pretty similar. Yeah, yeah, it's all like, pretty similar. Yeah. There, there's little things. It's going to be team specific, all of those things. So where do you have Matas and what do you think about him? So I have Matas, let me put my list up here. I have Matas number nine, but okay. I do feel like the gap between nine and like maybe six or seven is like really not that big at all. I like Buzelis to be, he is just like, a B to C tier version of which you're getting from Alex Sar, if that makes sense. But I do want to hear your evaluation of him first. So I think Matos is a versatile wing, and I think he's going to be a forward as his body fills out that can dribble, pass, and shoot. So I think that's the intriguing thing with Matos Bezelis is there's real dribble, pass, shoot. Uh, I, for some reason, Franz Wagner is like the favorite comp for all of these guys in this draft. I, I don't necessarily know why. Matos has a little bit of that on the offensive end. I don't think Matos is going to be that guy on the defensive end. Here's what keeps me intrigued. The three-point shooting was not good with the Ignite. He shot 27% on 3.3 attempts, 70% from the free throw line. But his rep coming out of high school was as a floor spacer along with these other things he could do. And I'll be straight, honest, and blunt. I'm giving all of the Ignite guys a bump. Every single one of them. Matos, Ron Holland, Tyler Smith, Almanza, if he stays in, all of them, because it was a disaster down there for that team. I've heard the developmental stuff was not good. There's a reason the NBA got rid of it. So I'm giving Matos just a little bit. There's a section of like intersection of size and skill with him. And Amari, I do think he's probably better than what people give him credit for defensively. I think he'll be really good off the ball defensively. He's got some slow feet on the ball, but he gives second effort. He has good length. I don't love him. He has issues, but I'm still keeping him here for now. I like his game. You mentioned giving the a bump to the Ignite guys, which I'm struggling to figure out how much of a bump I want to give. And I think I end up looking more like physical traits rather than stats because of that. Sure. Because it's just, again, like they had no shooting, no spacing. It's just... No was, point guard, no, no point, point guard. guard at all. You know, so you're asking so many guys to do stuff that you're not going to ask them to do in the NBA. So I guess to some extent you try to praise guys for what they did rather than what they didn't do. But again, I think that's just a really tough evaluation, which is why I probably have them a bit lower, which again, I think our tiers are probably similar in that the gap between five and nine is probably insignificant. I do buy into him defensively near the rim. Like I think yes, just the, yes. like his, his instincts, like, the block rate, like, I think that's going to hold pretty steady. Like, I don't know if I trust him, like, switching. Almost two much. blocks a game. Real quick, Amar. Just mm -hmm. almost yeah. two blocks a game and just under a steal a game, just to give people some reference. A real, sorry. When you go look up Ignite stats, guys, make sure you go to the full season stats as well. So if you go to Real GM for stats, 
they separate it into regular season and G League Showcase Cup, make sure you look at the full season stats. Sorry to cut you off. I hate how segmented G League stats are. I feel like I have to go to it's two so websites. It's so annoying. They the... have to fix it. It's so ridiculous. It makes no sense. It's like, it should not be this difficult to figure out what a guy averaged. Exactly. And like sample size is bigger than 15 games. But yeah, like defensively, I buy into him completely as like a four. But I think you probably need a floor spacing five next to him to really maximize his value there. You know, which would be problematic for some teams fit-wise. I don't know if he quite crosses that threshold of, like, you don't worry about fit at all. Like, you just take him like I do with, like, some so of the bigs. So do you not buy the up. jumper? I think the disconnect with Matos for most yeah. people is going to be, do you buy the jumper or not? Where are you at with, I know the numbers don't look great. I'll, I'll give you the high school numbers. He played at Sunrise Christian. He was 43% overall on 100 attempts. He was 43% on catch and shoot. He was 47% on unguarded in his senior year at Sunrise Christian, which is where Grady Dick went to high school as well, among other really good players. Like, I kind of wish I had seen more volume from him. Like, 3.4 attempts per game is, like, fine. Uh, Like, 26%. Like, that kind of makes you wonder a bit. And he also shot 70%, and he only had, like, two free throws a game, so he really wasn't getting to the line much as well. Which again, remember the ignite has the funny rule though they only they, they do, shoot they shoot one for true. two that's true yeah they do shoot one for two because I remember seeing that for school last year yeah. like but then I was like oh yeah like they don't have the same rules we have so that'll be a little bit different I like him as a prospect I don't love him I think he'll be he's not like a focal point shooter but he's a guy you probably won't, won't want to leave open to if he were like a little bit of a better athlete to shot it a little bit better or had a little bit more of like a I know all those guys have really bad assistant turnover ratios just because of spacing <laughs> like I'm not counting that against them. He's a tough evaluation for me. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll leave it at that. He's a tough evaluation. I like him, but there's other big prospects I like a lot more. I think YouTube user says, I like Matos way more in theory yeah. than on tape. I think that's probably fair. I think that's probably where I'm at. And maybe I'm overvaluing the theory of what he can be over what he actually is and just kind of buying into it. I will readily admit that. So number four on my board, Omari, is a guy that the Pistons should not draft at all. But I have number four, and that's Ron Holland. So I have him number four. Where do you have Ron Holland out of G League Night? I like that. I have Ron Holland eight. Okay. So oh, like wow. A this is going to be Brazilis. really good. And I, like he's another guy I struggle, but I actually, he's actually one of my favorite guys in the draft, even though I only have him at eight. And that's more so than me not having the guts to move him higher yet. <laughs> but he's so athletic. Like he's such a great downhill athlete, like especially at his size. He's a, I think he's a really good and really willing defender. He's a really strong rebounder. Like, again, like the block steals numbers, like athletically, I think he just really, really pops defensively. And I think that's really going to translate for him early. Like along with that, like even though he did not shoot the ball well by any means, he's 24% on 3.3 a- attempts. He actually kind of made up for that because he was like so much better at the rim. He Like, again, like he's just a freight train getting downhill. And when you look at it also, he shot 73% at when the line. Four attempts, yeah. It's like when almost four attempts, like he got to the line, hit his free throws pretty well. Even if the shot doesn't come, that makes you feel better about it because he's probably going to be a foul magnet in the NBA. Like I could just see that part of his game really, really popping with some spacing. He also was a, a willing passer. Like again, turnovers were a bit high, but he was a very, very willing passer. I think that part of his game could translate pretty well. Like he gives you pretty much everything as a wing that you would want except the shooting and it's like he shot so well at the line that I actually feel a bit better about him as a shooter than some other guys like his like mechanically he's got to speed his jumper up there's some mechanical stuff he has to work on but yeah like what QT says like four or five years down the line I could just see him being the best guy in this draft by like a wide margin and I'm like I really love his game and I think he'll probably be top five for me before it's all said to die yeah, one of the teams I like sending him to is actually the Wizards if Alex Sar isn't there or Donovan Klingon because I just think that they could kind of go for an upside guy, right? Like take a swing on a guy that really could truly become the best player in the draft. I mean, if, if he really shoots, and this is a very highly recruited player out of high school, like he was big time recruit, had a big time reputation with how hard he, like you don't often hear about high school kids and their defense and how intense they play on the end. Now, there's there, it's a little bit of what I felt with the SAR and a men coming out of overtime elite where I thought they had some issues in terms of like the fundamental types things, but we haven't seen that be an issue in the NBA, Amari. Like both of those guys were really good defenders. And so I think it's something I've learned where if there's guys with the athletic tools, they are engaged, they work hard, show some of that stuff. I really like what he can do on the defensive end, and he really gets after it. I'm also glad you pointed out the passing. 
He will get the reputation of being selfish because of the assist to turnover ratio. He is not selfish. He may make no, bad de- he may make some bad decisions, but he is not selfish. I also don't think he was in a great role with the ignite. I think Ron Holland is a true off the ball guard slash wing, probably more of a wing. I don't think he's a forward that attacks off pin downs and zoom actions and gets out in transition and those type of things. I don't think he should have been playing with ball in hand as much as what they were asking him to do. No doubt. And another thing, he gets the Reese's Shea bump in that he's younger than Reese's Shea. He yeah, will still he be 18 years old on draft night. So you're basically taking a guy who was probably just a couple months older than Jalen Duran was, I think. Like, Duran turned 19, like, that November. Ron Holland turns 19 a few days after the draft, like a week after, I think. Yep. And this dude was so young in a bad environment. He's still really, really popped. Like, like, but it's all said and done. He probably will be top five for me. I think if he had gone to college, like he'd probably be an unquestioned top five guy in this draft. I'm glad you brought that because that was one thing that I've said about Matos from the beginning. I never thought Matos going to the Ignite was a good decision. I want to touch on this real quick. V. Clark asked this earlier. Should we prioritize drafting a power forward before drafting a small forward? So just quick thoughts on that, Amari. Based on the current roster, would you rather have you know, a true four man, which is honestly kind of hard to find at the top of the draft, depending on what you think about Matos. Most of these guys are more threes. The first like four man, you're looking at Tijon Saloon, Tyler Smith is somebody I brought up earlier. Or do you think it is kind of these true wings, these three men like Reese Shea? I think that's truly what he is. Holland is a wing before he's a forward. Dalton Connect is a wing before he's a forward. What, what do you think is, would be more impactful? Yeah, I think it just really comes down to the player. Like, if you're number one, you just take Sar, but he's pro- much more of a, a power forward, obviously, than a uh, wing, but you just take him. Like, you really can't go wrong either way when you look at the guys who fit that mode at the top of this draft. I'll just say just take the best player either way because likely you're going to address one spot or the other, either through free agency or the draft anyway. So to me, uh, in this draft, you just take whatever prospect you think is better there. But you have needs up and down the roster, right? So you really can't. The, the bigger need is probably at power forward, but to me, the gap's not big enough for any guy in this draft to where it's like, oh, well, I like this small forward board, but we need a power forward board, so I'm going to take him. Like, I'm just taking whoever the best forward is regardless. Yeah, I mean, I think the only person you d- or archetype you don't take is a primary on-ball guy that can't play off-ball at all. Like, yeah, Ken Cunningham it. is there. He wants to be on the ball. I didn't think I, I have to bring this. So, organic, where would Killian go in a draft this week? Killian Hayes fan on Twitter says yeah. Killian is going first. So I, I didn't think we'd get some Killian Hayes conversation in the comments, but well, there's going to be go. Killian Hayes talk, but there's Killian Hayes fan in the chat with the yep. Killian Hayes Abby. Yep, I love it. Okay, number five for me is Nikola Topic, the point guard from Serbia. He has not played a ton of games, like 19 games, because yeah. he was going to go play in a bigger league overseas and played like three games, I think it was, and then got hurt. This guy is a pick and roll maestro, great passer, great processor of the game, all of those things. There's some questions about the shot, but he's almost 90% from the free throw line under a 30%, excuse me, from the three point line, 50% from the field. There's some question marks with the defense. I think that's probably my biggest worry with Nikola Topic is the defense. This is another guy the Pistons have no business drafting whatsoever. This is just my personal board. Where do you have Nikola Topic? Yeah, I have Topic number six, and I kind of went back and forth between him and Castle for that five spot. I okay. Topic at six, and I'm sure we'll talk about Castle here soon. Yep. Topic, yeah, like I like his game. I think his touch around the room is just so good. He can finish from so many different angles. You talk about the lack of burst he has, but I think he makes up for it with his touch and his size. Not a great shooter, but again, like his touch at the line implies to be that he could at least become a passable shooter. Like he's like probably going to be like a 42% guy, but 36, 37%. Like I'm pretty confident he can get there. His handle is really good. I just feel good about him being a pretty solid all-around point guard. Like, defensively, he's not going to wow you. Athletically, he's not going to wow you. But pretty much all the other aspects of his game are there. And he's really young, too. Like, he's even younger than Ron younger. Holland. He uh, doesn't turn 19 till after Summer League. He will play Summer League as an 18-year-old. And again, I know some people, like, even NBA draft people will, like, get... I saw it on Twitter the other day about Jaime Hawkins. Guys, if, if people don't want to calculate age into this stuff, that's fine. I do. I think playing as an 18-year-old in a professional league is not the same as being a 22-year-old playing Division One basketball as it's not the same as being a 19-year-old playing in the G League Night Amari. Like, I just think that that stuff should be involved in the conversation at least in some way. 
It should be. Hey, I mean, yeah, just the eight. She's so efficient inside the arc. Like, really, really good at the line. Like, I just have no question that he's going to be a pretty solid, you know, at least above average guard for a long time just because of how well he maneuvers the pick and roll and just how good he is inside the arc. Like, I think the shot will come. Like, he's one of the probably five or six guys this draft that I feel pretty good would be plus NBA players. Yeah, I mean, he, in my notes, pro teams were doubling him. Like, that's how yeah. good he was operating and breaking down defenses. I watched a game where he was really bad in the first half, had a really rough, and I put in my notes, Amari, literally, I said, I love these opportunities to scout players when they have a bad half or a bad game, and we get a chance to see how they respond. And my notes for how he responded, unbelievable, impressive response in the second half. Made two threes, made a mid-range, attacked the basket, all of this in the third quarter. And that was one of those games where I was like, man, this really stood out to me in the way he responded to that. And so Nikola Topic, I think he's, somebody's going to get a real steady, solid point guard, maybe not crazy upside. Like It's not like it's Luka or something like that, but a very good point guard to run their team attack off ball screens. I think he will compete defensively. And like you say, he's very young. So, Yeah. Like I imagine the Spurs getting him and pairing him with Wimby. Sure. And it's Absolutely. just like, well, there's the next 15 years, you know? <laughs> yep. I love it. Yeah. All right. Next guy on my board at number six is Reed Shepard. So where do you have Reed Shepard? Yeah. No, this is, I think I'm high on Reed and probably look at this right now. I have him number three. I love it. Yeah. No, I, I don't yeah. think... I don't think that's crazy. I think a lot of people do. My thing with Reed Shepard is I think there is some fit stuff there. My biggest question, like we'll get to all the positives. I'll let you sell Reed Shepard. Not that he, you know, we all kind of know. I worry about the on-ball defense, Amari. Like I have real questions about somebody that's six foot three that I'm not sure is going to stay in front of NBA players that well, even though he has amazing hands. He had blocked shots in college did a lot of really, really disruptive things on the defensive end. I do have a little bit of worries about how he guards on the ball. But, I mean, if he shoots 50% from three, it doesn't matter, right? Like, this kid can absolutely light it up. Yeah, it's just, like, I don't, like, he will give up some size on defense. He's, like, 6'3", like, not the biggest 6'3". So, you're going to have some issues there for sure. For me, just how good his hands are. Sure. Just... Like to be like, I still feel pretty good about it. Like you do have guards who give up size, but they're just so pet, like pesky that you know they're still gonna, gonna make an impact. Like a Fred Van Fleet, right? And sure. like Reed is bigger than Fred Van Fleet. Just he was just so absurdly efficient last season. Just like mind blowingly. Like how do you do this over thirty three games efficient? Yep. Uh, like fifty three point six percent overall, fifty two point one percent from three. More than half of his attempts were from three. Didn't get to the line a lot, but. Two and a half steals, about four assists, positive assist to turnover ratio. Like, you could just pick, pair him next to Cade Cunningham and just be absolutely set in your backcourt. Like, just absolutely set. If you're going to pair him with a guard smaller than he is, you want a guard like Reed Shepard, who's just going to absolutely stress the floor and just give defenses fits because of how far out they have to guard him. And he can handle secondary playmaking, like, like, I just look at him and I'm just like, this dude, like, is going to be one of the best players in this draft one way or another. And I almost look at him like I look at a guy like a Desmond Bain, where at some point the numbers just outweigh the concerns. And for me, his numbers are just so good. Like, he's one of the only guards I would take in this draft if I am the Pistons, just because I know I have so many guys back there already. But. I just have no question in my mind at all that Reed Shepard and Cade Cunningham could be a winning backcourt as long as you do what you're supposed to do at the other positions. So, yeah, I mean, and one thing is he is 19. He'll turn 20 this summer, I believe. He has a June birthday, so a little bit older for a yeah. freshman. So we have no concerns about Shepard being an undersized, complete no-show in the tournament. Nope. My response to that is nope, none go, at all. go look at Brandon Miller's NCAA tournament from his freshman season. And then do you think that that should have kept people from drafting him too or had any effect on his rookie season? Yep, so it's one game. It's one game. One game. You know, at, at the end of the day, Wes says he has Reed Shepard number three as well. That's so right. yeah, like I, I just, no, I, I don't have any huge takeaways from him not being great. We have a sample size, Amari, yeah. you said it, of 33 games and he plays in the SEC. So yeah. with all due respect, like I love small school products. Like I absolutely love them. One of my favorite players is Deron Holmes, the second out of Dayton, the A-10, not like the most popular and people are going to crush him because he played in the A-10. But at the end of the day, 
Reed Shepard played in the SEC for how many ever games of his season? And this dude shot 52% on almost four and a half threes a game. That's the sample size that I'm willing to believe in over a one game sample against a team that plays the wonkiest defense, one of the wonkiest defense you'll find in college basketball. Yeah, last point on just not counting the NCAA tournament when it comes to these things. Like, I remember Kevin Durant laying an egg <laughs> in the tournament, and ever since then, I've, I've just never really paid attention to that ever. Like, if it's a bad performance through one game, I don't worry about that at all. I think a sustained good performance through the tournament can raise a guy's stock in my mind. One bad performance won't. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Let's no. I have one more question on Reed, and then I'll yeah. let you take it. So uh, I want you to answer this, and then take us to break because you yeah, did yeah. so smoothly during the first segment. So we'll see so, if you can. That's my responsibility now. All yeah. right. Do you, how much do you think he can play on the ball? Because I think this is the ultimate upside. So I have people like you know, organic says undersized Luke Kennard, cool. Like so, obviously he's not excited about him. Top five, I get it. Somebody else said like you want to go. You know, YouTube user says. Where could Shepard be above average besides shooting? Like, I get all of this. So this is the thing for me and probably why I tend to agree that I'm a little bit lower. I don't think he has the on-ball juice. I think he can be a secondary creator, like a second side creator. Do you think he could be the second creator? Like, Cade comes out of the game and now Reed shifts to point and he runs the show. I think Reed, if I'm the Pistons, I think Reed is probably a better playmaker than a lot of the players I currently have but behind Cade. So that's the difference maker for me. Like he is not going to be like like eight assists, two turnovers or anything like that. But I think he crosses the threshold of if he's your lead playmaker on the floor, you probably feel pretty good about it. Like he's probably not like a super industrial point guard, but if you can just get like combo guard playmaking, like you just need him to man it for like 12 to 14 minutes at night. Like I think you're in pretty good shape. Real quick, I I would rather put the ball in Jay Nivey's hands. You okay. know, and I know that's that fair. like, that's like fair. I this is why I'm just a tad lower, right? Yeah. Is I think there's real on ball questions and I don't see the on ball creator. I love all of the other stuff. So take us to break, Omari. All right, and then all right. when we come back, we'll uh, get to as many guys as we can. Yeah, I think we have four guys left, right? Yeah, so I would be at numbers. Yeah, so we'll get seven, eight, nine, ten. Probably going to need to talk 11 a little bit because I think people are going to be pissed at us for where we have that guy. Yeah. So we definitely need to talk about him. All right, cool. We'll go to break. We will go to break. All right, we're back. Segment three. We have four, potentially five more players to talk about. And we have, like, let's just call it 20 minutes. Let's try to get do this as fast as we can. So here it is right here. Tubop says, Cody Williams is my pick if we fall out of the top three. This is the guy you guys are all going to be pissed at us about. I can tell you guys right now, uh, my number seven is Dalton Connect. And this is a guy that, older prospect, right? He just turned 23 a few days ago. Actually, I will say, I give Dalton Connect a little bit of a different eval than, say, Kevin McCuller, who's a guy at Kansas that's been like five or six years in college, have all been at big time Division I programs, major conferences. Dalton Connect was a late bloomer in high school. Dalton Connect went JUCO out of high school. Then he went to Northern Colorado, which like Northern Colorado has all of a sudden become this hub of sending guys to higher levels. They have this kid, St. Thomas, who just committed to USC. But point being is he hasn't spent five years in a major conference, division one programs, weight room, defensive system. Like if he was five years at Tennessee Omari and still this bad defensively, I would hold that against him a whole lot more. But this guy put up insane scoring numbers in the SEC night in and night out. He can really shoot it. At the very least, you're getting a guy that can really score the basketball. Yeah, he's also my number seven. This is probably the only pick that we both had in the exact same spot. Like, I like, like, Connect is just a bucket. Like, I don't think you have to really think that hard about him. Like, if you do have, like, if the Pistons are number five, for example, then he's there. Like, like, I think that's a pretty easy pick to make, depending on who else is there. But yeah, like, dude's just a bucket. 46% overall on high volume. 40% from three on high volume. Got to the line, 77%. Again, like, high volume at the line, too. Like, he's a true three-level guy. Not the greatest playmaker. But again, like if you just need an off ball score, like you can put him next to K to feel pretty good about it. He's six six, like a good athlete too. Not the best defensively, but I think again, like if he could just be passable on that end, 
and you could just upgrade your, you know, like your front court defense a bit more, you could probably get away with that. And he's just a bucket. Like, I think you can just take him and you know exactly what you're getting. And he's a huge upgrade for a team that just needs everything, right? Steven Sugg says, connect can connect, but can't create. Like, I don't think you would draft. If you're drafting him to create, then no. Like, he yeah. shouldn't even be in the lottery if you're expecting Dalton Connect to be your primary creator. I, I think he was actually overtaxed offensively at Tennessee because yeah. they didn't have anybody else that could really score. I don't I don't think a team is going to put the ball in his hands and say, go get a buck. I'm saying what he can do is he can knock down catch and shoot threes. He can then attack closeouts. He is more athletic than what you would give him credit for. One of the kind of the roles is what Tim Hardaway Jr. was doing for the Mavericks at the start of this season. Not recently. Don't, don't watch it recently because it hasn't been pretty. But just like comes in and he knows his role is to just absolutely get buckets. Dax Hoops asks, do you compare him to some of the Nova guys, older prospects, but doesn't have the same upside? I, I wouldn't, Dax Hoops. You bring up Brunson and Hart. He didn't come up in that system. He didn't grow in. Like that was my point. With, listen, I played Juco. I love the path. But you're not getting the same level of nutrition, weight program, defensive energy, like all of that stuff as you do at, say, four years of Nova or Kentucky or wherever. And even at Northern Colorado, it's still not the same as being at Tennessee. So my point is, I think there could be a little bit more upside because he hasn't been at one of those major programs for all of those years. Let's go to the next one. I think this is going to be one where we're vastly different. I have a feeling you're way higher on this guy. And number A, I have Stefan Castle. I struggled with him too, uh, but I did end up with him at number five. And it's interesting, like his stock really has bumped following the tournament, which I think just reaffirmed the stuff he was already good at. But he's just like, there's always a guy in the draft, right? He develops a shot. He becomes a star. And Castle and Ron Holland, that's to be a really the guys who kind of fit that bill in this draft. I like Castle. Like he kind of reminds me a little bit of like Anthony Black last year. Like I, I think even more like savvy and polished, like just really good savvy defender. You know, could probably handle multiple rows on that end of the floor. Uh, he's just a guy that really, really competes. Like I thought he had so many big moments in the tournament, just as a, a, a leader, which really stands out. Really solid passer. Like he's big, like he's around 6'6", six, six, but I really do think he's like primary point guard type playmaker at the next level. The thing with him, again, it's just the shot. He wasn't super high volume, and he also only shot it like 27%. So you look him like, look at him shooting 76% at the line, and that helps a bit. But he's not a guy that shot the three well. He's not a guy that really gets to the line a lot either. So you kind of worry, like, offensively. It's weird because he still, like, can score, right? Like, it's not like he's, like, yeah. a non-scorer. Like, he can still get to the rim. Like, he's got a, a good handle. He's got some some juice to his game. I just don't see him getting anywhere close to the ceiling if he can't knock down open threes. And that's why I have him right at five. But that's like a high five. Like, he's a guy that I may become lower on if he's not shooting it well through workouts. Yeah, so we'll talk. We'll, I'll give my thoughts on Stefan Castle. Yeah. Steven Sugg says, do you think Connect or Ivy is better with Cade? Like, the idea of what Dalton Connect is makes more sense, right? Just because he's a floor spacer and all that. Now, listen. Please do not aggregate this and say that I think Dalton Connect is a better player than Jaden Ivey. You know, sometimes I get criticized for Jaden Ivey stuff. I like, I feel like I'm the highest person in this space on Jaden Ivey. So that's not what I'm saying. If you're just saying fit and archetype, the archetype of Dalton Connect probably makes more sense. YouTube user says Connect or Ivey Hawkes. I think they're different players. Hawkes was just like did a you know a little bit of everything. So savvy, you know, makes like he plays in the mid post. All of that stuff. Huck is not great defensively in the same way Connect. I yeah. think the upside of Connect scoring is probably a little bit more there. Stefan Castle, you hit it on it with the, the floor spacing. That it's concerning. Yeah. This is a guy I started scouting super early in this process out of high school. He was a little bit of a late bloomer. He really rose. The shooting was a concern back then, Amari. Another thing that was a concern back then also was the defense. I'm insanely impressed with how far this kid has come on the defensive end. Yeah. He was incredible. He might be the best perimeter defender that we've talked about so far. Ron Holland does it with maybe a little more athleticism and energy. Stefan Castle can absolutely defend. And when you're not making shots the way he wasn't, for him to stay engaged the way he was, was really impressive. So I really, really like Stefan Castle. I don't think he makes sense for the Pistons because of that shooting concerns. We saw it play out where like teams just literally weren't going to guard him and he wouldn't shoot it at times. What do you think NBA teams are going to do? So I like it a little. I wish he was 
For his sake in general, I wish he was a little bit more of a true on-ball creator. I think that's what people thought he was going to be coming out of high school, and it really didn't come to fruition in his freshman season at Connecticut. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, is he a primary guy, or is he more of like a secondary creator? I yeah. do think he has primary potential, but he's not like a, like a true point guard passer where he's going to be dishing three assists for every turnover or anything. I think his assist is trying to... He, did, he wasn't like a super high assist guy. He just, I think, controls the game really well. Uh, but what really worries me is that he does not have any sort of track record as a shooter at any stage of his basketball career. And, you know, there are just so many guys everywhere where it's like, well, if they did this and that, they'd be so-and-so, right? And most, yeah, more often than not, those guys don't develop this and that. Like, that's, those are outlier skills to develop those types of things after you're drafted. So I like Stefan Castle a lot. I've been a bit surprised to see him rise to like top three even in like some circles, like I'm not quite there yet. I have him pretty firmly in like that five through 10 range. But again, like I like the feel he plays with defensively. I think he's outstanding. Like teams do need those types of guys who could just really pass their opposing teams like a Jalen Suggs or you know, like I mentioned Anthony Black or like a Bison Daniels even. Like those guys have the like utility in the NBA. I just want to see him knock down some shots from the outside. And just to give him some credit, so he did get better throughout the season. The last 20 games, he was 30% on almost two and a half attempts. And he had a six-game stretch, I think it was end of January, where he made 44%, but it was just on 18 total attempts. So even yeah. the volume isn't there. But just to give him a little bit of love. Okay, let's go to number nine on my board. And this is where I have the big man, Donovan Klingon. And I will say this. This is an instance where what he did in the Big East tournament and throughout the NCAA tournament, it, it rose on my board because it showed me things I was looking for and what I thought he was going to be coming into the season. And, you know, he battled some injuries and stuff like that. He had some games where he played major minutes, which is one of my biggest concerns with Donovan Klingon is how many minutes can he play within an NBA game? Where do you have Donovan Klingon? Yeah, so this is probably our biggest gap. I have Klingon number two. I love it. Cool. I have him number two behind he, he went number two in the most recent community mock that we did yeah. because I took Saar at number one for the Pistons. Whoever was picking for the Wizards took Donovan Klingon. I, I think this, and to me, I would have thought about it for the Wizards. Like I probably would have taken Ron Holland, but Klingon may have been my number two guy for the Wizards in that scenario. So even though I have him nine, I essentially just said on the Wizards big board, I may have him number three. So uh, this is what this draft is. Absolutely. I just think he is an absolutely transformational defender, like seven foot seven, just the instincts. Like you combine that, like I thought he improved a lot offensively every season went on where you're seeing passing flashes and just soft touch on the jump hooks. Obviously, he's a threat to dark pretty much everything down there. Like he was a guy that you could build around to be like he does. It. He has everything really except the shot. But when you have a guy who's seven two with a seven seven wingspan, that's probably primarily playing in drop. You just commit hard to that archetype and then just surround him with shooting, right? Like, I just look at Klingon and he just does so many things right. The only other thing that worries me about him is his free throw shooting because you probably can get to the point to where you're playing hack of Klingon or sure. whatever they come up with to play off of his name just because he only shot like 56%, I think. But he's just such a transformational defender. Like, he's just a guy I look at and you combine that with just the feel he has on offense and like, he's my starting center for the next 10 years easily. Like, I have very few question marks about the way he can impact the guy. No, I mean, I, there, there's real defensive upside with him. I, I think my biggest thing with him, and he had some flash plays in the Big East in the NCAA tournament, is his movement, his recovery ability. Because I think a lot of people will say, well, why not Zach Eady then, right? I, I just don't think their movement ability is the same. Yeah. Um, there's also an age thing here, and I, I can already see the age. You know, people are going to come at me about the age stuff. You know, he doesn't turn 21 till next February. I looked at their sophomore year seasons between Edie and Klingon, and they were actually very comparable. And then Klingon just, or excuse me, Edie just exploded, obviously. And, and Edie, he did very well for himself as well throughout this season and through the NCAA tournament, getting himself into real first round conversation and considerations. I think he probably does end up being a first round pick as we sit here on April 22nd. Talk about this. Klingon, also Amari, I think one thing that really helps him offensibly, I think he passes the ball really well. I yes. think he's staying and he passes the ball really well. Not only I that, he does not turn it over. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing with Jalen yeah. Durant. I, I don't yeah. mean to like, all of a sudden we're really good. You know, so yeah, Steven Suggs says Klingon or Durant. 
Oh, I don't want to answer this. Do you want to answer that? No, I'm not going to touch that right now. Yeah, I'm not touching that yeah. right now. Either. I do this on game theory. Sam tries to bait me into <laughs> Jalen Duran conversations. And this is the one where truly you can't play those two guys together, though. I mean, it no. would just have to be a, hey, we're going to play each of them 24 minutes a night and we'll figure out which one is better. But yeah, I, I'm not touching that one right now. Like you say, Sam tries to walk me into those. Yeah. I'm like, nah, we, we're not. Not before you have to. Not before yeah. you have to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no reason on that one. No. All right. Number 10, I have Rob Dillingham. Yeah. So I had Dillingham number 11. But I so think. Let's, just, let's talk these last two. We yeah. have 10 and 11. We had Dillingham and, and Cody, Cody Williams. Williams. Yep. I, I would guess, my guess, Omari, we will get more conversation, whether they're texts, DMs, comments, whatever about how low we are on Cody Williams than any other conversation we've had today is my guess. Probably so. And it's interesting because I like we kind of talked about this with Reese Shea, but it's one of those things where it's like the idea versus like where the player actually is. And that's probably I would assume that's probably why we're both a bit lower on them, even on paper. I also think he potentially could be a really good fit for the Pistons. It just depends yes. on how much you buy into the aspects of his game he didn't really show. I would say this about Cody Williams. I have him 11 on my board. He could get as high as fifth on my piston specific board, right? Because you're taking out Topic, you're taking out Ron Holland, you're taking out Rob Dillingham in most of these scenarios. So here's my thing with Cody Williams. I, I love a lot of the idea of who he is. I like his length. I think he's a very good defender. He is just 19 years old, turns 20 in November. The three point shooting, and I know the percentage is good, but he just he is another guy that would not take them. Yeah. I, I, I may be over compensating or whatever for this but I just struggled in so many games where I watched and there was just a complete lack of aggressiveness at all and that worries me Amari because it's like okay if you're already a little unaggressive in college what's gonna happen in the NBA and maybe I will learn a lesson here this is my first year like truly going full in with this NBA draft scouting stuff but I just can't get that out of my mind how many times I watched him play. Now, here's what may happen. Maybe we heard, we'll hear he, you know, the injury was lingering all year and that was holding him back. One final thing, Amari, I wasn't as high on Cody Williams coming out as high school as a lot of people as well. So that's another reason why I'm a little more comfortable keeping him lower is I had him pretty low to start the season. He's actually really risen up my board even at 11 because I didn't love the high school tape. Yeah, I feel like a, a lot of the reason why uh, people do see him as like this top seven or eight guy is because of his brother. Like Jalen Williams was a late bloomer. He yep. was 12th in his own draft. People didn't expect him to be as good as he has. And of course, he came in and pretty much exceeded every expectation from day one. And I think people, you know, to some degree are probably giving Cody Williams the same benefit of the doubt where his trajectory will kind of resemble his brothers a bit. And in this draft, like, I'm not mad at taking that shot at all because I do think Cody Williams is a very fundamentally solid basketball player. It's just, if you are looking at what you want from a modern small forward, you want a versatile defense, you want some combination of versatile defense, playmaking, shooting, rebounding, right? Like, you want, like, a Swiss Army knife. And Cody Williams is not really quite that. Like, he did, you know, average 12 points a game on, like, eight attempts. Like, he was really efficient inside the arc. He did shoot about 42% from three, but you talked about just sort of how passive he was and the reluctance and he just took so few three pointers. Like you just don't know how much, how much stock to put into it when he's taking fewer than two a game. Like you're creeping up on like non shooter territory yeah. almost, especially as a small floor. Like just based on volume. Shoot whatever percentage you want. If you're only going to take 1.7, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like that's just, the volume is just so low. And on top of that, he wasn't, he didn't really stand out as a playmaker he didn't really stand out as like a rebounder. Like his rebounding numbers really weren't that great. And you just kind of look at his overall and it's like his best case to me is probably just based on what I saw. It's probably like a Trevor Ariza type, which again, like Trevor Ariza played what 18 years. He had a great career. You know, I just would like, I just wish I had seen a bit more from him and I'm not just hoping he begins to show things that he hasn't shown because just based on his tape, he looks like a pretty solid rotation wing, but not necessarily a guy who's going to swing any outcomes for you long term. I mean, again, and so I think that's what I would love to know. Like, I would love to interview Cody Williams or watch film with him. Like, why didn't you take this shot? Why weren't you more aggressive here? And maybe he has all the right answers, Amari. You know, you know what I mean? Like, that's that's the type of intel we don't get 
because we don't know why. Maybe Colorado didn't want him. Like they had other really good players. KJ Simpson, incredible player, maybe the best college player on their team. Tristan Da Silva, talk about a dude that did well for himself in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. He's a first round pick now after a big NCAA tournament. So like who knows some of the answers to these. I will say, I think there's a chance he's really good defensively. And I do think he has really good touch around the rim. And if for some reason he is able to fill out his body, the, you know, that's one, not one of many reasons why Jalen Williams is so successful is because he's freaking jacked. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like if Cody is going to do that, if you tell me he's going to fill out his body and look like his brother three years from now, okay, I'm a lot more bought in. I just, I came away a little bit concerned with some of that stuff. And it may just be a personal like preference thing as well. But again, I know Victor was was hoping for a little bit more than this. He says, "Ugh, this draft is so hard to dissect." Listen, if you want Cody Williams number three on your board, I'm not going to argue with you. Like, I'm I'm cool with I, not that like everybody is entitled to their opinion anyway. If you do your work, I'm I'm all about it. It just it is really hard. Let's finish with this real quick. Amari Caleb says, "What do you think that is this one skill that more often than not translates to the NBA?" My initial thought was rebounding. I feel like that's one thing you know. Got Brandon Pajimski is the a great example of this right now. This was a big time thing on his scouting report and it's translated into his rookie season. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question to try to narrow that down to one skill. I would say just processing and I'm fairly most best reflected in maybe like assist numbers. Like I think a guy who could really move the ball in college and didn't turn the ball over a lot like to beat, I just sort of points like innate processing and you're probably never going to struggle with turnovers in the NBA to the extent that some other guys do, you know, I think rebounding, a lot of that can just depend on like athletic pop and p- position. Sure. You know, I think shooting like generally guys who shot pretty well at college and high volume can shoot in the NBA, but some guys just never adjust to the quicker pace or the longer line for whatever reason. I would go off assist numbers, like assist to turnover ratio. If you were a guy that was really efficient at that in college, like I'm going to trust you could do that at the next level and still be pretty good at it. And he says, and second question, what skill often correlates to success in the NBA? And yeah. I'll just say, if you saw the graphic going around on Twitter the other day, three-point percentage yeah. correlates to success in the yeah. NBA. I, I, I sent it to Wes because he's like a data stats guy. And he said, he, he sent me a, like a paragraph. I'm, uh, I'm not going to be able to read all of it. But essentially, it was like, I always appreciate it, Wes. He was, I believe he told me he's like kind of a floor raiser. Like yeah. anybody who was above league average from three-point percentage was above 500 at the very least. You know, so... And again, Wes and I, this turned into a Pistons conversation, Amari. You know what the Pistons weren't good at? Shooting threes. Yeah. They turned the ball over all the time, and they fouled a lot. A lot of things you can't do. (laughs) All the things you can't do that I would call floor raisers. Like, maybe you're not winning an NBA championship just because you do those things well. But I don't think you win 13 games if you do those things well. And they did all those things like 28th, 29th, 30th in the NBA this season. Yeah, you know what was funny? Like just watching the Pelicans Thunder, this is like this really tough defensive game where both teams had like 46 at halftime or whatever. And like one team had like 10 turnovers and never had 12 with like four minutes left in the fourth quarter. And I was like, <laughs> this is what normal basketball looks like. Like it's, yes. it is abnormal to turn the ball over 16 plus times almost every single night. Like if these guys can start the game shooting Below 40% of fourth quarter, only turn the ball over that many times. Like, like that's just shows how much more you have to improve in that. It was funny. I was watching the yeah. game. I was like, man, this team is turning the ball over a lot. And yeah. they're like 10 in the third. I was like, oh, they don't have eight. You know, because you're just so, when you you're watch just, the Pistons yeah. and you're like, they've turned the ball over a lot, it's 20. Yeah. And, you know, it just seemed, last thing, Avid Sports Reader says, I think you might be underrating Cody Williams with his frame and positional value. And that's I, fair. Yeah, I agree 100% with the positional value. That is fair. Like, yeah. if you want to say there's no reason to have Reed Shepard that high, Rob Dillingham that high, even Topic, I get it. I just think that there's going to be teams that do need those type of players. The frame would be an interesting conversation. Uh, send me a DM or something because I'm a little curious what you mean there in terms of just his length or do you think like that he's definitely going to fill out? Because I do think he has good length, but if he doesn't fill out, there are some strength concerns Caleb, last thing here, and then I'll let you take it away. Amari says, great insight, gentlemen. Always a pleasure hearing y'all talk ball. Y'all got me through the rough season. Looking forward to your content, getting us through the summer. We appreciate that, guys. Thank you so much. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the like, hit the subscribe. Help us continue to grow. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, again, five-star rating. Leave us a review. Ashton dropped in again. Keep grinding, fellas. Thank you so much, Ashton. Uh, Join us anytime, my guy. 
And then, yeah, we love these, you know, reviews and thoughts and we appreciate it so much. It's going to be a fun off season. Yeah. You know, we're going to have a lot to talk about in the Pistons world. So if nothing else, it'll be a good content, Amari. No, we've yeah. talked about it and just then not people stuck with it through this season. Like, it, you know, it really is gratifying. Uh, I asked somebody on Twitter, I forget the context, but they were like, like, not like defending this past season, but they were like, I feel like Pistons fans are like spoiled because of the past success. And I'm like, I feel like half my followers on Twitter were not alive for their last championship. Like, this is like the least <laughs> spoiled fan base in the league right now. And we really do appreciate no, the continued support we've gotten. I, I, I do not think that's fair. This I is, was like, yeah, it's, I, I was it's, like that's it's crazy, the, man. <laughs> it's the inverse of what I tell people when yeah. I'm like, oh, well, I'm a Chiefs fan. And they're like, oh, lucky you. I was like, no, 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 no. No, it's been Chill. bad for a while. I, I, I grew up a Chiefs fan. I watched all the crappy years. I watched them never have a good quarterback. When they did make the playoffs, it was some heartbreaking defeat where Andrew Luck fumbles it to himself and Marcus Mariota throws a pass to himself. Oh, like, I was, like no. <laughs> His, Piston, this yeah. Pistons fan base has been through it over the last how many ever years. So yeah. let, let's not go there with that. Yeah, no, you guys stay tapped in. And it, I mean, this is going to be another crazy offseason. Like, I know we say this every offseason, but this is going to be another one. So continue staying tapped in with us. There'll be a lot of fun stuff to discuss. So with that, I'll close this out. Big thanks to our audio producer, Robin Chen, our editor-in-chief, Deco Avery Nichols, our executive producer, Ajdet Delgado, and our sports editor, Kirk Lane Crawford. And a big shout-out to Wes, as always. And we'll talk to you all next week. I'm not you, calling you, it that. Like, you naturally want to say pobo, so it's only nice that you say hobo, which just sounds disrespectful.